When I first played Devil May Cry 5 back around its release in 2019, it felt like I had discovered one of the greatest games in the world. Every aspect of it blew me away, leaving me in awe of what it had to offer. But today, as I revisited it, my perspective has shifted slightly. That's why after 4 years of its release, I am eager to re-explore this iconic Demon Slaying masterpiece and take you with me. Let's start by looking into the cool factor. I think that it's one of the most prominent characteristics of the entire Devil May Cry franchise. It is cool as heck. It's clear that the game designers undoubtedly followed the rule of cool. It states that whether something defines physic, logic or just overall does not make any sense is irrelevant, as long as it is cool. Every weapon, sound, animation, voice line and cinematics all are crafted with this mindset. Starting from the very beginning of the game, the opening title sequence. This sequence alone is one of the most badass and captivating introductions I've ever witnessed in gaming. It sets the tone perfectly, giving players a taste of what they are about to play. And it continues throughout the whole game, even in the smallest details like, for example, checkpoints. In other games a checkpoint might be a simple bonfire, a typewriter or a statue. But not in Devil May Cry 5. Here you call for your checkpoint and wait for it to arrive something like this. Or even like this. They didn't need to do that and easily could have spent their time on something else. But they did, and it's these little touches that make the whole game truly badass. This mentality actually reminds me a lot of anime. In anime 2 we often see examples of the rule of cool in action. Take Naruto for example. Despite its plot holes, continuity errors and sometimes questionable character writing, it remains one of the most popular and recognizable pieces of media. Why? Because ninjas with elemental powers, supercharged ice and lightning fast combat are just undeniably cool. It's no surprise that Devil May Cry also originated in Japan and shares the same spirit. Crafting cool characters and situations is something many games attempt, and it's not that special just in itself. What sets Devil May Cry apart is the sheer scale of its badassery. It takes the concept of over-the-top design and brings it to life. Not once during my playthrough did I think, no, this was too much and should have been toned down. The opposite, I anticipated every next cutscene, every new enemy introduction and boss encounter. The execution is practically flawless and in the world of Devil May Cry, being cool reigns supreme. And it is especially evident with the next topic. Devil May Cry 5 offers a truly immersive experience through its innovative use of music. I can confidently say that the game's soundtrack is one of the best in the whole gaming industry. The music in Devil May Cry 5 elevates the gameplay and adds an unparalleled level of coolness. You see, the music in this game is adapt. What this means is that the soundtrack dynamically responds to the gameplay, intensifying as you excel.
While Capcom definitely did not come up with this concept, they made it work. It's not too elaborate and can even break, but most of the time this feels great. What adds even more is that each character has their own song that was specifically written for the game and perfectly aligns with the characters and their personalities. I can't help but feel an exhilarating rush of awesomeness when the chorus kicks in after reaching an S rank. Each combat encounter basically becomes the challenge to keep an S rank for as long as possible to savor the entire chorus. Then there is the feeling of internal pain every time you get hit and the music gets quiet, which only serves as motivation to get up and start fighting again, so that you can hear more epicness. This seamless integration of music into gameplay is nothing less than a stroke of genius. However, the major gripe I have with this whole thing is the inconsistent use of this fantastic music mechanic. Surprisingly, a significant portion of the game doesn't utilize the adaptive soundtrack, instead regular soundtrack play. This is not that bad as songs can still be quite good. But there are missions where it is just a general background soundtrack with nothing special. Reaching an S rank and not hearing the chorus coming in is disappointing. The genius of Devil May Cry 5 sound design extends beyond its music. Every weapon swing, explosion and demonic roar resonates with a satisfying impact, immersing you further into the action-packed world. And this attention to detail also enhances the gameplay. The chaotic beauty of huge battles filled with splashes, explosions and gunfire, complemented by an awesome soundtrack, creates a mesmerizing symphony of auditory delight. Before we delve into the gameplay and story, I want to address another big thing – the controls. It's no secret that DMC5 is a very complex game that has so much going on. And needless to say, creating a comfortable control system for such a game is no easy feat. So yeah, the controls can feel a bit clunky at times. One of the main culprits of this clunkiness is the contextual nature of the controls. Depending on whether you're locked onto an enemy or not, the same button can trigger entirely different moves. It's just not very intuitive and can lead to some confusion initially. But with practice you'll become more comfortable with the system. I got fully accustomed to it and had no frustration in the later stages. So it is fine. What wasn't fine is the fact that Devil May Cry 5 suffers from a case of button overload. There are so many buttons you want to press simultaneously that it simply overwhelms you. It's a finger-tangling frenzy of lock-on, jump, melee attack, ranged attack and special move inputs. Sometimes I have found myself contorting my hand into bizarre shapes just to hit multiple buttons at once. The fingers will resemble possessed demons themselves as you desperately try to execute that badass combo. But the overall control system is not garbage or anything. It's just clunky and that requires time to get used to. After that first period of accustoming, I was much better with the layout. This is also true for keyboard and mouse. I have beaten the game like that too, even though it was even clunkier. 
it is just a thing that you need to embrace. With time and practice anyone can start unleashing stylish combos that would make even the most seasoned demons tremble in fear. First and foremost, let's address the core essence of Devil May Cry 5 – the three playable characters. It is essential to understand that each of the three characters brings a unique flavor to the table, from their movement to their combat styles. I want to acknowledge and commend the game for executing this aspect exceptionally well. So now I'll go through them one by one, look at their personalities and gameplay, starting with Nero, the fiery protagonist. Nero is, unexpectedly, the main hero of this game. This is very new, as Dante always has been the main protagonist. The whole series is about Dante, but this time it's Nero's time to shine. Nero takes charge right from the get-go, rocking the hero role for the first four missions. In fact, out of all three characters, he has the most missions. I understand why this has been done. New players might struggle to catch up on Dante's backstory spanning four games and an anime series, while seasoned players already know basically everything about him. So it's the perfect time to shine the spotlight on Nero, the fresh blood of demon hunting. Gotta pay attention, sweetheart. Nero is a charismatic demon hunter with a fiery personality, dripping with confidence and determination, and an knack for delivering witty one-liners. King? You? I don't know. I mean, you're a big guy and all, but you seem more like a knuckle-scrapping fart in the wind than anything else. Yeah, no offense. But underneath that tough exterior beats a genuine and compassionate heart. He's just a kind and innocent soul who wants to read the world of demons so that everyone can enjoy some peace and quiet. What is it? You hungry? <laughs> well, you're in luck, pal, cause food's ready and Kitty A always makes too much. Hope you like loud talkers too, cause got a pair of those upstairs. You see something you like. Being part demon himself, Nero used to rock a demonic right arm called the Devil Bringer. It was a major gameplay and story element in the previous game. But prior to the start of this story, Nero actually lost this arm along with all the powers it brought. This is tragic, I really like Devil Bringer. It is not in vain though, and expert craftswoman Nico stepped in with an ingenious solution. She invented Devil Breakers a collection of prosthetic arms each packed with its own special power. This allows Nero to have a very unique gameplay as he swaps out his Devil Breakers, completely changing his style on the fly. It's like a high-tech Swiss army knife for demon slaying. Need mobility? Check. Crowd control? Check. Massive damage? Check. There's even a Devil Breaker that mimics his old Devil Bringer abilities. Though not everything is perfect in Nero's arsenal. What I didn't like is that Devil Breakers are a bit unbalanced. Some fall short in comparison to other variants, while others seem situational and difficult to use. But maybe that's just my playstyle. On the other hand, Gerbera has been a lifesaver in my playthroughs. Since Nero's evasion is not the best, having a weapon that allows for instant movement in any direction is an absolute must, especially during boss fights. Another thing that seemed weird to me is Nero's sword, the Red Queen. On paper, I enjoy this weapon design a lot. A sword with an engine that can produce a super attack when heated up is an awesome design. But when it comes to gameplay, it feels a bit weird. Requiring either 9 slow button presses for a full charge or precise timings on your attacks, this feels wonky. Again, maybe it is just my playstyle, so I wonder whether other people also think the same way. So, what's your name? I have no name. I am but two days old. Just kidding. You can call me V. V is an enigmatic and mysterious newcomer in Devil May Cry. He literally just shows up on Dante's doorstep with a job offer for him. Right from the start, we know absolutely nothing about him. Who is this guy? How does he know Dante? 
What's his motivation and what's his secret to controlling demons? Nothing makes sense and is kept secret from the player, which makes it hard not to be intrigued by his enigmatic nature. V is nothing like Nero or Dante and brings a fresh and unique flavor to the game, both in terms of his gameplay and personality. V is calm, collected and polite, a stark contrast to other demon hunters. He is a man shrouded in mystery and does not speak more than necessary. A distinctive trait of V is his extreme fondness for poetry, as he often recites lines when speaking to people or even enemies. I curse my stars in bit of grief and woe. That made my love so high and me so low. His looks are also unique. Pale, slim and weak, uses cane to move around. It is wild to see someone like him on the same stage as these guys. What is even wilder, he somehow fits perfectly. He's like the calm before the storm that is approaching. When it comes to gameplay, V is without a doubt the most unique character in the game. He is nothing like any other gameplay in the series. Instead of engaging in direct combat himself, V relies on his familiars to do the dirty work for him. Though his demons can't kill other demons, so he uses them to weaken enemies and then strikes a finishing blow himself with his stylish cane. One thing to notice about his gameplay is that he is very button mashy, as the bulk of his gameplay consists of keeping your distance from enemies and spamming different combos while reading a book. You can see how this gameplay is very unconventional for the series. Also, this makes him probably the clunkiest control voice, because you want to literally control three characters at the same time, Griffin, Shadow and V himself which demands an impressive display of finger gymnastics to handle the multitude of simultaneous button presses. This premise, though very unique, certainly makes V the easiest character to play in the game. You don't need to worry about aiming, getting up close and personal or pulling off last second evasive maneuvers. It can sound like I am scolding this playstyle, but actually I think that it is great. It's a refreshing change of pace that sets V apart from the rest and adds variety. If the whole game was just V, it would have been way too repetitive. His levels are the least fun to replay for the tenth time. But as a novelty for the first few playthroughs, he is awesome. However, one big downside of V is his lack of progression in gameplay. Throughout the game, Nero and Dante both unlock new abilities, weapons and even forms. V, on the other hand, doesn't get any new shiny toys. He starts the game with his three familiars and ends the game with them. Sure, you can upgrade their moves and make them more powerful, but there would be nothing to shake things up. No new demons, no new weapons, nothing that will alter the gameplay in some unique way. Not in this lifetime. All in all, I find that V brings an intriguing and unique dynamic to Devil May Cry 5. His enigmatic nature, unconventional gameplay and progression may have their pros and cons, but all of them together in one character contribute to the game's overall freshness and novelty. Last but not least is Dante, the iconic Devil Hunter. What's a Devil May Cry without Dante? The wisecracking, demon slaying legend of the series. In Devil May Cry 5, the beloved protagonist returns with a story that intervenes his past exploits with new challenges, showcasing his growth as a character. As expected, Dante is still as cocky, hot headed and funny as ever. Never misses a beat when it comes to cracking jokes and delivering witty quips. Come on, little puppy. I'll take you out for a walk. Come on, let's go. But beneath his charismatic exterior, Dante also has his serious moments, adding depth to his character. I've got all the power I need, right here. You don't understand. It's not what I mean. <laughs> this is reflected in his appearance. For most of the game, we see Dante after a full month of flying in some ditch. And let me tell you, it shows. 
He looks beat up, dirty, unshaven and overall just unkempt. This is interesting, because it's quite a departure from the image of Dante we're used to seeing, always at the top of his game. This time he seems almost depressed, which perfectly fits the narrative of Dante's arc. Dante's character development and story in DMC5 heavily builds upon the foundation laid in previous installments, delving deeper into his complex history and personal demons in an attempt to resolve them. The narrative uncovers Dante's emotional struggles and it was truly intriguing to witness his evolution from a carefree devil hunter to a character burdened by the weight of his past. Gameplay-wise, Dante's style is the epitome of versatility. His arsenal boasts an array of weapons, each with its own unique playstyle, allowing for experimentation and the creation of devastating combos. The game rewards players who master Dante's diverse moveset, making him an absolute joy to play. With 4 melee weapons, 4 ranged weapons, 4 combat styles, a devil trigger and a sin devil trigger, Dante offers endless possibilities for combos and replayability. I won't lie to you though, I really can see how some players may find his complexity a bit overwhelming, especially newcomers to the series. Becoming a true Dante master requires time, dedication and a willingness to embrace the chaos. But trust me, it's worth every button press. How's that for road rash? Here I want to delve into the general gameplay of Devil May Cry 5. There are a few noteworthy aspects, both enjoyable and negative, that deserve attention. Continuing with the theme of three playable characters, there is one downside to this system. Surprisingly, you don't have the freedom to choose which character to play on each mission, even in New Game Plus. So, if you have a particular affinity for V and yearn for more playtime as him, well, tough luck. Only six missions in the entire game are playable as V, and there's nothing you can do about it. The next thing I want to talk about is the overall difficulty. Devil May Cry 5 is very interesting on that front, because the game offers deep and versatile gameplay, resulting in a sky-high skill ceiling, that only a select few can reach. But the secret is that reaching that level of mastery is not at all required for having fun. You don't need to be a button machine virtuoso, constantly swapping between weapons, style and devil triggers to have a good time. You can stick to your favorite moves and have your own playstyle. In fact, you could probably complete the entire game by spamming forward attacks alone. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Hell, you can even beat the last boss of the game by just blocking and attacking, basically two inputs. But here's the catch. Deep down, you know you wouldn't be satisfied with such a mundane approach. It's all about the rule of cool. You find yourself getting caught up in it, craving that feeling of being stylish. You're aware of the character's potential for unleashing all inspiring combos. It's only up to you to bring them to life. That's why you always strive for coolness, to gracefully juggle enemies, chain together epic combos and time your devil breakers with finesse. And don't forget the grading system, it only amplifies this desire. All this creates a great gameplay loop of constantly trying to one-up and surpass your previous feats and refine your personal style. You find yourself hoping that the next encounter will be the one where you channel your inner devil hunter, achieving that elusive smoking sexy style grading and feeling undeniably epic while doing so. Now let's talk exploration. Devil May Cry 5 may not have sprawling labyrinths or intricate metroidvania elements, but it still manages to offer some interesting exploration, mainly thanks to all the secrets that are sprinkled around the levels, waiting to be discovered. Most of these secrets don't require any puzzles or convoluted paths, they simply demand that you be a curious demon hunter, keep your eyes peeled and pay attention to your surroundings. It may not be the deepest form of exploration, but it's enough to keep you engaged. 
There is one aspect of exploration that left me somewhat disappointed though. The overall visual design. Or rather how it falls off in the second part of the game. In the first half, the scenery is beautiful and constantly changes. You find yourself amid the city ruins, venturing through abandoned metro station, leaping across sunken buildings, exploring warehouses, engaging in combat within a library, and even facing a boss battle in a church. It's a feast for the eyes and a testament to the developer's creativity. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the second half of the game. Once you step into the demon tree, everything becomes more or less monotonous. From one level to another, it felt like I'm trapped in the never-ending bowels of the same tree, experiencing a bizarre sense of déjà vu. The developers did make an effort to alleviate this monotony. But alterations like shifting the color scheme from brownish red to bluish white are superficial and don't really make levels much more interesting. Spending almost half of the game within this tree starts to feel tiresome. I couldn't help but yearn for the same level of design and variety that captivated me during the first half of the game. Besides exploration, there are other interesting elements and surprises that freshen up the gameplay. One standout moment occurs when you find yourself fighting these familiars as Dante, the very same creatures whose movements you controlled when played as V, and they are still using the same moveset. It's just a neat idea for a fight. Another cool segment involves a co-op moment when V and Nero are fighting side by side. I only wish there were more moments like this, instead of it being a one-off for 5 minutes of the game. I must destroy. I thought that was the plan all along. Throughout most of the campaign you will see other demon hunters going about their own business in the distance. While this is interesting and adds a sense of immersion, it's a shame that you can't interact or collaborate with them in any meaningful way except that one time. The story of the Devil May Cry series can be a bit confusing, with the second game being almost a spin-off that is rarely mentioned, and the third game being a prequel, it's easy to get lost in the depths of the DMC lore. So let's address the burning question. Do you need to play the previous games to grasp the story of this game? Well, it certainly helps to have some familiarity with the series, as Devil May Cry 5 is a direct sequel to Devil May Cry 4. However, fear not, for Capcom has done a commendable job of making the story accessible to newcomers as well. They sprinkle in enough exposition and backstory to keep you in the loop. They even provide a handy short movie accessible from the main menu to fill you in on all the essential details. The story itself is remarkably simple, but not bad at all. The premise is the most straightforward Devil May Cry can be. There is a huge bad demon called Urizen that is wreaking havoc and aiming to ascend to Demon King and take over the world. In their first encounter, our devil hunters face a crushing defeat against Urizen, during which Dante calls Nero a dead weight. So then they retreat and try again in a month. Now the city is in ruins, overrun by demons, with a massive demonic tree at its center. And that's where the game proper begins. As I said, a simple premise. Nero is on his way to the demonic tree Clyphos, determined to put an end to the chaos. His motivation throughout the whole game is very commendable and relatable. He wants to prove to Dante that he is not a dead weight. Yeah, this is bizarre. One of Nero's biggest driving forces seems to be the fact that Dante called him a dead weight. It really got to him and he clings to it, bringing it up whenever he interacts with Dante. Why don't you sit this one out? Oh, that you call me dead weight again? No thanks. Forget about saving the people or preventing world domination. Nero's focus is on proving he's more than just dead weight. I'm not gonna let you have all the fun, Dante! You don't get it. Uh, 
Let me guess. I'm dead weight? I'm dead weight? I'm dead weight? I'm dead weight? Of course, it is not his single reason to fight, but it is humorous how important this is to him. I'm dead weight? The plot of Devil May Cry 5 may seem straightforward on the surface, but it's the intricate details that truly matter. From the very beginning, the game presents itself as kind of a mystery. Who exactly is this formidable demon Urizen? Why is he so powerful, yet we never heard of him before? And what's the deal with V? Who is he, why is he here, and why does he possess such extensive knowledge? As the story unfolds, the game teases us with hints and allusions, making it clear that these revelations are crucial. It suggests that Urizen isn't some random newcomer to the series, and V, well, he's clearly hiding something and knows far more than meets the eye. V, what the hell are you? It's not until the very end of the game that the truth about these things is unveiled, leaving players in shock. Unless you paid attention or have even a sliver of familiarity with Devil May Cry, then you'll likely figure it out long before the big reveal. The game drops numerous hints, making the so-called secret more of a running joke among players. It's amusing, really. This demon got a name? I find myself wondering why they build up this suspense when most players would have pieced it together early on. Yet this oddity doesn't detract from the story or diminish its quality at all. The only aspect that remains more or less enigmatic is this story. You might have some inklings, but I think that his reveal manages to be more intriguing. Disclaimer time. Continuing the discussion about the story and the game overall inevitably leads to spoilers. It was hard enough to avoid them until now. So if you want to avoid them, this is it. Huge thank you for watching up until this point. It really matters a lot. Let's continue with the story. From the very beginning, it was glaringly obvious that Urizen is none other than Virgil, Dante's twin brother. Literally in one of the first cutscenes that we see, a man steals Yamato and uses it to open a portal. It's undeniably Virgil behind the sections. The attempt to keep this revelation a secret afterwards seemed futile. Urizen was never even his true name. It was simply a play on words chosen to symbolize Dante's reason for fighting. This demon is your reason. Your reason for fighting. Your reason, get it? So what about V? Well, it is revealed that he is also Virgil. In a belief that his human side holds him back, Virgil split himself into human and demon halves. V represents the human part he desired to discard. That explains V's extensive knowledge and why he sought Dante's assistance. This twist adds an intriguing layer to the narrative, and is a less obvious reveal than the Urizen identity. And then another bombshell drops. Well, you can That's show not it, you what is it then? He's your father! While not entirely unexpected given Nero's resemblance to Dante and Virgil, as well as his affinity to Yamato, it remains a satisfying revelation. While all this is happening, Dante undergoes a personal transformation, fully embracing his demonic side and unleashing untapped power. This newfound strength enables him to defeat Urizen, even after the latter consumes a fruit promising immense power. Just when it seems like the story is reaching its conclusion, V reunites with Urizen, merging back into Virgil. This signifies Virgil's realization that discarding his human health only weakened him acknowledging the significance of his memories and emotions, even if they bring pain. That day, if our positions were switched, would our fates be different? Would I have your life and you mine? Virgil remains determined to become the Demon King, leading to a final battle against Dante. 
While Nero also wishes to participate in this fight, Dante explains to him that he cannot fight against his own father. Now he needs an ass kicking, but I can't have you go kill your old man. Thus, the ultimate clash between Dante and Virgil commences. A battle that will determine the fate of the world. Just as the fight reaches its climax, an unexpected twist occurs. Nero awakens his dormant demonic powers, stepping in to stop the conflict and bring an end to this vendetta once and for all. It's a pivotal moment showcasing Nero's growth and his choice to forge his own path, preventing Dante and Virgil from killing each other. This ends right here. And finally proving that he is not a dead weight. No, seriously, he is still bitter about it. You listen, dead weight. I'm dead weight. After Nero defeats weakened Virgil, a change of heart occurs, and Virgil decides to establish the truth with Dante, choosing to venture into the demon world together to vanquish the Clyphos. This concludes the story on a kind of a positive note, with Nero returning to his wife. Yeah, I'm coming home while Dante and Virgil continue their eternal battle against demons and each other. Truly a jackpot ending. Wait, so the entire story of Devil May Cry 5 goes something like this. Virgil decides to split himself into two. So Virgil goes to Virgil's brother and Virgil's son and hires them to battle against Virgil all so that he would become the real Virgil and fight them again, featuring Virgil from the Devil May Cry series. As there was clearly a big lack of Virgil in this game, he also was added as a playable character in a later DLC. Of course, I'm joking. Adding Virgil as a playable character is basically a well-established DMC tradition now, so it's no surprise to see him here. In fact, today you can't get the game without this DLC. Both regular and deluxe editions just have Virgil included. Though, if you bought the game prior to 2021, you will need to purchase DLC separately for $5. Unlocking Virgil as a playable character provides access to the entire campaign, as well as the Void and Blood Palace game modes. It is important to note that Virgil does not have his own campaign. Instead, you can play through the main campaign consisting of all 20 missions as Virgil, replacing the three regular characters. This means that these missions have no story or cutscenes and overall are not canon. It is simply an additional option for players to enjoy. Playing as Virgil has a really fresh and distinct gameplay style. His moveset largely consists of the same moves he performed as a boss and from his previous appearances in the series. Virgil is a badass, and he shows this with every move he does. His swift and precise combat style feels incredibly satisfying. The ability to teleport around the battlefield and effortlessly dispatch enemies adds a sense of fluidity and grace to the gameplay, especially when wielding his iconic sword Yamato. I particularly appreciate his concentration mechanic, which rewards you with increased damage if you are skilled enough. It just fits Virgil. And I really like that some of his moves resemble those of Dante, highlighting that despite them appearing so different from one another, they are still connected as two brothers. One notable highlight of Virgil's playthrough is the final mission where you get to fight against Dante instead of battling yourself. It's basically a single unique detail to his campaign, and a very welcome addition, especially when comparing it to Devil May Cry 3, where playing as Virgil men fighting against a red-dressed Virgil. Virgil's gameplay is undeniably satisfying, 
it is not a bad DLC for sure, especially considering that it is now essentially free, but it just had so much more potential than this. It would have been even more enjoyable to have a dedicated Virgil campaign that delved deeper into his motivation and past, adding further depth to the character and the game. Having unique missions specifically designed for Virgil would have been awesome. It would also have been nice to see proper weapon unlocks that are exclusive to Virgil, akin to Dante, rather than recycling the same ones from previous games. Devil May Cry 5 shines as an exceptional game, possibly the pinnacle of the entire hack and slash genre. Its incredible soundtrack and seamless adaptive music implementation plunge players into unmatched levels of immersion. The game excels in character, enemy and sound design, with the addicting gameplay loop and incredible implementation of the rule of cool. All this together delivers an unforgettable experience. Yet, amidst all this glory, there remains one glaring flaw, one huge disappointment. Devil May Cry 5 had the potential to be even greater. This is evident from the fact that the game still has thousands of players every day and an active community. Players continue to crave more content and eagerly anticipated additional DLC that would provide something substantial. New levels, weapons or even characters. I have no doubt that such DLC would have been an instant hit with a massive player base. Sadly, no such content has been released. And the reason behind this missed opportunity remains unclear. Maybe it just never was a plan. Nevertheless, I can't help but feel that it could have been a tremendous opportunity for a game like this to further expand and grow. We are left hoping that they are at least actively working on Devil May Cry 6, and we would not need to wait another 11 years. Somebody call a doctor? Let's see. Which one wants to play? <laughs> 